Hey everybody, and welcome back to History Student Reacts. Today, we are continuing Epic History TV's fantastic Napoleonic War series. We're going to be watching Napoleon's Vietnam, Spain, 1809 to 1811. So at this point in the series, you know, Napoleon's had some ups and downs. Um, his initial invasion of Spain was a bit of a low. You know, he's had some struggles, but he is basically still the uncontested master of Europe. Britain is the only one who's really trying to contest him, but Napoleon, you know, he basically rules over a good chunk of Europe. He's the most powerful man on the continent. But, you know, as I mentioned, we've already seen some struggles, and things in the long term will get worse and not better for Napoleon. Anyway, I'm really excited to get into this one. These videos are always great, so let's jump right into it. Spain, 1809. This war was my downfall. As I think I mentioned in the last one about Spain, this whole, uh, the war in Spain with all this guerrilla fighting, it was referred to as Napoleon's bleeding ulcer because it would just, you know, bother him for years and years and years. And uh, I think we're going to see some of that right here. In 1809, Napoleon Bonaparte, Emperor of the French, was at the height of his power. Mm. He had just won another crushing victory against Austria at yep. Wagram, and imposed a humiliating peace treaty. But the war he'd started in Spain and Portugal, with his ill-judged invasion the previous year, continued to rage. Yeah, and like, I, like they just mentioned, Napoleon was at the height of his power, and like I said, Napoleon was basically the uncontested master of Europe. But, you know, there are some signs that Napoleon is not as unchallenged as he once was. Um, you know, the victory at Wagram was a comeback. You know, Napoleon was coming back from a loss. You know, the, the Austrian army had been reforming, and they'd been improving. And, you know, Napoleon's having some struggles in Spain... So, while Napoleon is at the height of his power, you know, there are signs throughout the continent that, you know, everything is not going super well for him, you know, things may start to crumble. But, I mean, at this point, you could also be forgiven for thinking, yeah, well, Napoleon's gonna, he's gonna keep going. I mean, it's very plausible at this point that he, he really could keep going, keep succeeding, keep winning. Um, in hindsight, we know that that isn't what happened over the next couple years. Napoleon had placed his own brother, Joseph, on the Spanish throne, uniting a proud country against him. Yep. His troops had dealt ruthlessly with popular uprisings while routing a succession of Spanish armies. In February 1809, Marshal Lann overcame the heroic defence of Zaragoza in a brutal siege that cost 54,000 Spanish lives wow. and 10,000 French. Yeah, an absolutely brutal, brutal conflict. And, and uh, some of the art they were showing, uh, one of the paintings was from Francisco Goya, a Spanish painter who did a lot of painting associated with this conflict, really showing how brutal uh, it was, because it was an extremely brutal and costly conflict. <clears throat> but still, the Spanish and Portuguese remained defiant. And three months after their escape from Coruña, mm -hmm. the British were back. In April, Sir Arthur Wellesley mm -hmm. landed in Lisbon to lead a small Anglo-Portuguese army. British redcoats would fight alongside Portuguese troops, who, with the help of British training, would soon prove themselves highly effective. Three weeks after arriving in Portugal, Wellesley moved against Marshal Soult's second corps, which had recently taken Porto. Soult and his troops, preoccupied with plundering the region, had no warning of the British advance, uh -oh. and were soon in headlong retreat, back through the mountains into Spain. Mm. Hmm. Wow. What a what Having a quote. secured Portugal for the time being, Wellesley planned a joint campaign with General Cuesta. 
commanding the Spanish army of Extremadura. On the 10th of July, the two commanders met at Casas de Miravete to discuss strategy. Relations between these two allies were not straightforward. Spain and Britain had a long history of conflict. Mm. The Spanish were deeply suspicious of British intentions in Spain, while the British had a low opinion of the Spanish army, which they considered poorly trained and badly led. Yeah, I mean, the Brits and the Portuguese, they had had a long-standing uh, friendly relationship, a lot of trade relations in particular. Not so for the Brits and the Spanish, you know, they were colonial rivals. And at this point, you know, it's obviously sort of the, the archetype of the rising British and the falling Spanish. So both sides have suspicions of each other and resentment towards each other. But, you know, they're fighting a much bigger threat at the moment. Wellesley's request to take over command of Spanish forces was rejected. Mm. But the generals agreed to a joint advance up the Tagus Valley towards Madrid, to be supported by General Venegas advancing from La Mancha. In the face of their advance, Marshal Victor's first corps withdrew to Talavera, where he was joined by King Joseph and General Sebastiani's fourth corps. The French plan was for Joseph's army to defend Madrid, while Marshal Soult led three corps down from the north to get behind and trap the Anglo-Spanish forces. But Joseph, worried by Soult's slow progress and General Venegas's advance on Madrid, decided to attack at Talavera. Oh, let's see how this goes. This video <laughs> is brought to you by our sponsor, Curiosity Stream. Shout Home out to them and their sponsor. thousand documentaries exploring um. themes such as science, technology, and the natural world. Yeah, we'll, we'll watch through the sponsor. It's only Professor respectful. Stephen Hawking and Sir David Attenborough. And if you've already watched all our videos, they've got bags of history. This is the place to go for high-end, hour-long nice. docs on Rome, the Middle Ages, the World Wars, Space Race, and much more. We've been enjoying Waterloo. Theology mm -hmm. stream is month free thanks to curiosity you know check out the original video and their sponsor and all that kind of stuff hmm. the battle of talavera saw british infantry bear the brunt of the french assault mm. they stood firm and repelled the enemy with disciplined musket fire and bayonet charges. Wow. I mean, the Brits were known for having a professional army for a while at this point. Obviously, you know, now Napoleon is sort of, uh, at, at this point, the, the master of military tactics and uh, warfare. But for a while now, the Brits um, and, and the Prussians, but um, that's sort of uh, aside from this, the Brits have been known for having a well-trained professional army. Um and I also didn't know that, um, I'm learning that the Brits had quite a role in the conflict in Spain, which I didn't really know. I don't know too much about the Napoleonic Wars. I knew there was a lot of fighting on the ground in Spain and Portugal. Um, I'm now learning about the role the Brits played in that, so that, that's pretty interesting. Talavera was a small battle compared to the great clashes fought that year in Austria. But it proved that under Wellesley, Britain's small, well-drilled army was a force to be reckoned with, mm. even though in the short term, victory achieved little. Yeah. Warned of Soult's approach from captured dispatches, the victorious Anglo-Spanish army retreated. While King Joseph and Fourth Corps marched against Venegas' army, which they smashed at the Battle of Almonacid. Uh, Talavera seems like a bit of a Pyrrhic victory, I mean... You know, the Brits and the Spanish won, but if you looked at those casualty numbers, they lost almost, if not about the same amount of men as the French, and they've been forced to draw back. So, uh, I'm not sure how much they actually achieved, um, though it is a good sign to win against the French. <laughs> that autumn, the Supreme Junta in Sevilla, free Spain's effective government, raised mm -hmm. two new armies for another attempt to liberate Madrid. 
planning to converge on the capital from north and south. But Wellesley, ennobled as Viscount Wellington for his victory at Talavera, had been so disgusted by the lack of Spanish cooperation that summer that he refused to risk his army. Wow. Okay. Predictably, Spain's inexperienced armies met with disaster. At Ocaña, they suffered their biggest defeat of the war, when a smaller force under Marshal Soult routed the Spanish army, taking 14,000 prisoners and 50 cannon. Jeez. I mean, that really shows you how influential the Brits were, you know? Um, despite the fact that, uh, you know, they're not necessarily making up all of the manpower and, you know, they've just landed here. This isn't their country. Clearly, their leadership is pretty important. Um, I wonder if... I wonder if Wellington made the right choice. Like, would it was it smart not to risk his forces? Would he have just lost a bunch of men? Or do you think he could have, you know, turned that loss into a victory if he was there? I'm not really sure, because I, I don't know too much about it, but maybe some of y'all have a perspective on that. A week later, the army of the left was heavily defeated at Alba de Tormes. Uh-oh. There was more bad news when Girona fell to the French after an epic seven-month siege. It's going bad for the Spanish. The Supreme Junta's plans to retake Madrid were in tatters, and southern Spain was now wide open to French attack. Mm. 1810, here we go. <laughs> okay. Seems optimistic. <laughs> in January 1810, King Joseph marched south with an army of 60,000 men. Spanish resistance evaporated. Spain's Supreme Junta was overthrown in a coup as Cordoba and Sevilla fell without a fight. Mm. Joseph, who still hoped to win over the Spanish with his progressive reforms, was welcomed by many as a savior from anarchy. Only Cadiz held out its defences reinforced by a British naval squadron, and was besieged by Victor's first corps. Meanwhile, Napoleon sent Marshal Massena to Spain with 65,000 reinforcements. Mm. He was reckoned one of Napoleon's best marshals, and had just been made Prince of Essling for his heroics in the recent war against Austria. You know, I suppose it's smart that Napoleon's sending some of his better men, because... Um, I mean, th it is going pretty well for the French in Spain right now, but one of the issues that was facing them and is probably still facing them is that, you know, without the leadership of Napoleon, the French are not nearly as successful um, as when they had the leadership of Napoleon. And obviously, Napoleon cannot be everywhere at once. You know, right now, um, well, I don't know where he is right now, but in this general period, you know, he's back uh, in Austria, you know, fighting fighting them. He can't be in Spain at the same time, so he has to leave it to his subordinates, um, though he does have some very talented subordinates to rely on. Massena was to lead a third French invasion of Portugal, take Lisbon, and chase the British back into the sea. Mm. He laid siege to Theodad Rodrigo, a fortified city controlling one of the main routes into Portugal, which surrendered after two weeks' bombardment. Wow. Wellington, with only 33,000 men to face Massena's 50,000, retreated. Massena crossed the Portuguese frontier and besieged Almeida. After just 13 hours of bombardment, a lucky French shot hit the Portuguese magazine. 70 tons of gunpowder went wow. up in a devastating explosion that made all further resistance useless. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> it was a serious blow to Wellington, who'd been relying on Almeida's strong defences to buy him time. At Busaco, he found a strong defensive position and made a stand. Massena's uphill frontal attack failed, at a cost mm. of 4,000 casualties. But the next day, the French found a way to outflank Wellington's position, and his retreat continued. As Massena's army neared Lisbon, his scouts reported something completely unexpected. 
Stretching oh. across the Lisbon Peninsula, protecting the city from attack, they found a new chain of fortifications in two major lines. Known as the Lines of Torres Vedras, the British and Portuguese had been constructing these defences for more than a year. Wow. Now the lines bristled with more than a hundred forts, redoubts and batteries. I mean, good to have some foresight, I guess. You know, this, it's the typical British retreat to the sea. Uh, I think I said this in the last part on Spain as well. You know, just many times throughout history, uh, the British army's been in a position where they have to flee to the sea and get the heck out of there. I mean, it makes sense. Britain's greatest asset is the fact that it's an island and it can hop on its ships and uh, sail the heck out of wherever they are, but it's a very, uh, it's very much a repeating trend. <laughs> Manned by 30,000 troops and 250 guns. Massena soon discovered the lines were far too strong for him to attack. Okay, impressive. What's more, a scorched earth strategy had stripped the surrounding countryside of anything that might help the French. While Portuguese partisans attacked French supply columns as they struggled through the mountains to reach Massena's army. Mm. Massena faced a grim predicament. Starved of supplies, too weak to attack, unwilling to retreat. But throughout this standoff, it was Portuguese peasants who suffered most of all. When their villages and farms were burned, many took refuge in Lisbon, mm. where thousands died of starvation and disease. Yeah, I mean, you know, we talk about the casualties of battle, but, you know, these are the other casualties of war, the civilians, whether... I mean, you literally end up as a, a victim of a battle being, you know, killed. Or, you know, your life is disrupted because your home is destroyed or your crops are destroyed um, or burned or any number of things. And you have to flee, you get displaced, you starve to death. You know, these are the other often underrepresented casualties uh, of combat. Interesting. Back in France, Napoleon had been preoccupied with his divorce from the Empress Josephine, and then a new marriage to Archduchess Marie Louise, daughter mm. of the Emperor of Austria. She was now expecting their first child. Nevertheless, from Paris, Napoleon sent frequent orders to his marshals in Spain and Portugal, urging them to take more aggressive action. But when these orders arrived, weeks later, they were usually out of date and showed little understanding of the problems his marshals faced. Right. He now ordered Soult, based in Andalusia, to go on the offensive to draw enemy forces away from Lisbon so Massena could take the city. Soult laid siege to Badajoz, a fortified city that controlled the southern route into Portugal. You know, you gotta, just something to note here that maybe some other people might be wondering about. All of the, you know, Badajoz, Andalusia, all the lisping, you know, uh, that is a particularly Spanish pronunciation. You know, I'm, uh, you know, an American, so when we learn Spanish, which I did, um, we usually learn it more in a Latin American or a Mexican sense, and so they do not lisp, uh, you know, that sound, but in Spain, um, there's a lot of that, you know, th lispy sound associated with their Spanish. Um, so that's why he's pronouncing a lot of the words like that, which uh, may c confuse some people. Because if you're not from Europe, you're probably not used to that. When twelve thousand men of the army of Extremadura marched to its relief, they were routed by Salt. After which, the city tamely surrendered giving up 8,000 prisoners and vast quantities of stores. It was another heavy blow to Spain's armed forces. But remarkably, despite such disasters and their many blundering generals, the Spanish troops remained willing to fight, the courage of the rank and file undimmed. Wow. 
Very impressive. Victor's first corps, besieging Cadiz, had now been so weakened to support other operations that the Anglo-Spanish garrison decided to attack. The Allies landed along the coast to strike at the French siege lines from the rear. But they were ambushed by the French at Barossa. Mm. Despite heavy losses, the Anglo-Portuguese rearguard fought off the enemy. But a furious falling out between British commander Sir Thomas Graham and his Spanish counterpart General La Peña threw away any advantage. Oh man, another example of the Brits and the Spanish can't get along. We didn't get any details on that one, so I don't know the exact situation, but that's a shame. I mean, you know, you gotta be, you gotta have your leadership unified if you truly want to act in an effective manner, and they're definitely having uh, some issues here, um, which I mean, you know, it's not surprising, like I mentioned earlier, the Brits are this rising and proud power, whereas the Spanish are, have been on the decline for a while, but they are a, a proud people with a long history and a powerful history, um, so they, they also may be unwilling to take orders from the British as they might see it, whereas the British might be thinking, well, we're the superior force, you know, we have the better trading, we should take charge. So you can kind of see how conflict might erupt between these two allies. Soult, alarmed at these developments, marched back to Andalusia. Meanwhile, Massena, out of food and with no prospect of reinforcement, had no option but to retreat. Mm. Wellington's army pursued, wow. discovering evidence of several appalling atrocities committed by the French against Portuguese villagers. Yeah. Yeah, it was brutal. There were running battles with the French rearguard, brilliantly commanded by Marshal Ney, mm. until he was sacked by Massena for criticizing his leadership. What the heck? Come on now. Having chased the French out of Portugal, Wellington besieged Almeida. Massena's army, now rested and reinforced, marched to its aid. The two armies clashed again at Fuentes de Onuro. In two days of heavy fighting, Massena failed to break through Wellington's position to relieve Almeida. The fortress fell the next week, but to Wellington's fury, British bungling allowed most of the French garrison to escape. <laughs> oh man. Massena had lost 25,000 men in Portugal. Uh -oh. Now he'd lost Almeida too, and a string of bad decisions, not mm. least to bring his mistress with him on campaign, had cost him the respect of his officers. The marshal, whom Napoleon had once nicknamed the dear child of victory, was recalled to France in disgrace. Wow, that's quite a fall. That is a fall from grace, but I mean, as we've seen, he doesn't really seem to be doing a great job. So, probably deserved, I would say. Never to hold senior command again. Wow. Napoleon sent Marshal Marmont to replace him. Meanwhile, Marshal Beresford, the British commander of Portugal's army, was sent to retake Badajoz with 20,000 British and Portuguese troops. When Soult approached with a relief force, Beresford marched to meet him at Albuera. Hmm. It was one of the bloodiest battles of the war. Around 6,000 casualties on each side, with Jeez. more than a third of the British infantry killed, wounded, or captured. Marshal Soult declared, There is no beating these troops, in spite of their generals. Hmm. I always thought they were bad soldiers. Now I'm sure of it. I had turned their right, pierced their center, and everywhere victory was mine. But they didn't know how to run. Ha! <laughs> okay, that's that's an amazing quote. And, it, I mean, it really shows the sort of perseverance of the Spanish and Portuguese troops during this conflict, and also the absolute brutality. You know, they were willing to keep fighting, and that means much higher casualties. Uh, it also sort of... <laughs> Shows you it's that, like, French sort of arrogant attitude. I thought they were bad soldiers. Now I'm sure of it. Like, I had them beaten. 
why don't they know that? <laughs> you know, my, my command was better, my tactics were better, my strategy was better, and yet they wouldn't run away. Um, but, the, I mean, they were just willing to persevere and keep fighting. Um, I, you know, I'd really, I don't know if there are going to be more episodes on Spain, but it'd be really interesting to learn more about this because this is a really interesting period in, in Iberian, I'll say, because it's Spain and Portugal in the history of the Iberian Peninsula. And, you know, it is curious that, you know, it's this era of, you know, harsh, brutal guerrilla fighting. And then a little more than a hundred years later, Spain would see another era of harsh, brutal guerrilla fighting, the Spanish Civil War. Uh, yeah, it's really, really fascinating. Soult had been checked, but he was determined to save Badajoz. The newly arrived Marshal Marmont marched to his aid, and they advanced again. This combined army forced the British to abandon the siege. But when Wellington withdrew to a strong defensive position across the Portuguese border, Soult and Marmont did not pursue. Mm. French commanders in Spain had learned grudging respect for Wellington and for hmm. the steadiness of his troops. Yeah. For now, the war in Spain had entered stalemate. Wow. Mm. Yeah. That, I mean, that While sounds British, about right. French and Spanish armies crisscrossed Spain and Portugal. Another war was fought every day in the mountains, hills, and woods. From 1808, Spanish and Portuguese civilians, militias, and ex soldiers began taking up arms against the hated French invader. Yep. They waged a war of ambushes and hit and run raids, known in Spanish as La Guerilla. The Little War. Its fighters became known in English as guerrillas. And there we go. That's where we get the term guerrilla warfare, or guerrilla warfare, um, as it comes from. Now, I mean, it's not like this is the first example of guerrilla warfare ever. Um, I mean, there's arguments to be made that uh, a lot of the fighting in the American Revolution was actually guerrilla warfare. Um, but, you know, this is sort of... You know, we sort of see guerrilla warfare emerging in this time period with the American Revolution and this conflict in Spain. Um, and obviously we get the term from here. So, you know, it's this really interesting sort of modern hit and run style of warfare. And like I was saying earlier, you know, Spain would see another period of this about 100 years later. And I just find it really, really fascinating because it's a situation where... You know, it's the civilians, the people, taking up arms against, you know, foreign invaders. You know, this is, uh, I mean, there is army versus army, but it's also just small bands of civilians who are doing successful hit-and-run attacks on, you know, trained professional French forces. I just find it really, really interesting. Britain's Royal Navy supplied vital weapons, stores, and money, often landing them behind enemy lines. Much of Spain's rugged countryside fell under the control of the guerrillas. Mm. North of Madrid, Juan Martín Diez, an ex-soldier known as El Empecinado, the stubborn, led a guerrilla band 6,000 strong. In Navarre, Esposimina, a former peasant, ran a highly organized band that caused havoc for the French, capturing convoys and couriers on the strategic burgos Bayon road and branding Viva Mina on the forehead of collaborators. <laughs> While in the Damn. West, Julian Sanchez, known as El Charo, led the self-styled Lanceros de Castilla. El Charo himself wore a French hussar's cap, its eagle symbolically turned upside down. <laughs> These guys are just like badasses, you know what I mean? There were dozens more bands operating across Spain, though a few were no better than bandits, terrorizing civilians as often as the enemy. Yeah, I'm sure. The guerrilla war was merciless, marked by hideous atrocities on both sides. A French soldier's greatest fear 
was to be taken alive by the guerrillas, who often tortured their prisoners before killing them. Tens of thousands of French troops were tied down by this people's war, guarding outposts or patrolling the countryside. The roads were so dangerous for French messengers that they required cavalry escorts of 200 men or more. Wow. Many still didn't get through. Their valuable dispatches forwarded to Wellington, for whom they became an invaluable source of intelligence. Mm. I mean, you can just think of how disruptive this would be to the French forces. You can hardly even send messages. Um, and think about supplies. You know, your whole supply line, your communication lines, your military forces are all being extremely disrupted by just these, you know, civilian forces. Um, and perhaps because this was so disruptive, you know, this would style a warfare, this uh, guerrilla warfare would go on to inspire, you know, a lot of rebels and fighters throughout, I mean, the, the rest of history, you know, until the present, um, in the next 200 years, you know, this would be very influential. A lot of people would take notes from these guerrilla fighters. The war in Spain would ultimately cost the lives of 240,000 French oh soldiers. Oh my god! As was typical in wars of this era, most died from disease. But more died fighting guerrillas wow. than in battle against the British. I mean, look, I mean, that's exactly what I'm saying. Look at that. Most from disease, of course, because um, of the era. Um, and, I mean, disease would be a major killer in warfare for more than 100 years to come. But look, look at this death toll. We've got 45,000 from, you know, official battles um, against, you know, the, the Brits. Um, and 76,000 from the guerrilla war. This is how brutal it was. Uh, you, you're, I mean, a lot of these guerrilla bands are able to deal a, a lot of damage without taking too much damage. Hit and run. It's extremely effective, especially in a more rugged, mountainous uh, ter territory like uh, the Iberian Peninsula, or at least much of it. You know, it's crazy how how brutal and how much death this caused. British and Spanish armies. However, it was the twin threat, a well-led regular army under Wellington and a popular insurgency that left the French facing an impossible strategic dilemma. Yeah. If their armies remained dispersed to fight the guerrillas, Wellington could attack. But if they concentrated to defeat Wellington in battle, huge swathes of the country would quickly fall to the guerrillas. Mm. This was Napoleon's Vietnam, or <laughs> his bleeding ulcer, as he called it. Yep. A war that cost his empire an average of 100 casualties every day, Jeez. with little prospect of victory. And in 1812, as Napoleon launched his gigantic invasion of Russia, Wellington and the guerrillas launched their own offensive that would mm. turn the war in Spain on its head. Okay. That was a fantastic video. Um, you know, if you're Napoleon and you're invading Russia, you would rather not have a bunch of your men tied down on the Iberian Peninsula in Spain, not to mention a bunch of your men dying in Spain. Um... And I, I like the, f the phrase Napoleon's Vietnam. I mean, you could say that about many conflicts, you know, uh, the USSR in Afghanistan, the USSR's Vietnam. Um, but, you know, basically to suggest a conflict where, you know, it lasts for a long time and it does a lot of damage to you, despite the fact that you are technically the superior force. Um, so yeah, that was a great video. Really interesting. Um, I'm excited to continue the series. Um, looks like we are going to get more of Spain, which I'm excited about. Uh, I hope you guys enjoyed this one. If you did, please leave a like, subscribe, check out the Patreon, all that good stuff. Uh, and I hope all you guys are having a good day. Uh, and I will see you all again next time. Goodbye.